Let's welcome back our uh, co-hosts, the mogul, Delegate Michael Hornby. Good to be seen. How's the empire? Crumbling as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Proud to be a part of that crumbling empire. Also, Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matthew Harvey. He has absolutely no jurisdiction whatsoever absolutely. in Berkeley County. Good morning. Good morning. Great to have you. We are produced by the sports doctor, uh, Colin McLaughlin. And on uh, Tuesday of this upcoming week, we will have our candidate forum. This is part one of two. The second one's on the 22nd. This first one on the 15th will be from 8 a.m. until noon at the Berkeley County Commission Chamber Meeting Room. That's the second floor at 410 West Stephen Street. Uh, Mike, you coming? It'd be great to have you there. Well, I'll be behind the camera. <laughs> yeah, you are the cameraman for that. Uh, you're unopposed. Mr. Height unopposed, too. There's yes. a lot of seats in Berkeley County that are unopposed. A lot, Most, if not all, the Jefferson ones are opposed. That is correct. But there's a lot of uh, contested races, too, for the, all those positions we're losing. Yeah, and we're going to have the uh, the Agriculture Commissioner, Kent Leonhart, will be here, along with his uh, competitor, Deborah Stiles, and they'll be part of this as well. We're going to lead off uh, the debates on Tuesday with Sheriff Rob Blair and Mr. Jackson, his opponent as well. So that will be the first hour and a half, 45 minutes of the sheriffs, then 45 minutes of the ag commissioners. Yeah, Kent, Kent should be really happy. He just got $10 million for drought relief, so he should be in a really good mood. That Tuesday. was part of yeah. your supplemental of appropriations yeah. from your special session, right? Yep. All right, very nice. Uh, we turn our attention now to our 9 o'clock guests sitting patiently while we chatter. And that would be Joe Elliott from Community Alternatives to Violence, who we know from Mr. Larry Schultz, by the way. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for having us. It's wonderful to have you. And Nicole Rome, good to see you, Nicole, from Epic. Thank you so much for having me. Eastern Panhandle Empowerment Center with locations in Jefferson, Berkeley, and Morgan County. Yep. Yeah, you're out of, you guys are both out of the Martinsburg locations for where you do your business, though, Correct. right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so uh, explain the relationship between the two of you because I know that it makes a lot of sense when you understand what the work is that the two of you do for what you do. So I'll let you go first, Joe, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so uh, Epic and CAB actually are partner agencies working against domestic violence, and Nicole can elaborate, but they are working with the survivors of domestic violence. Those who are experiencing domestic violence need advocacy services, need safety, and so on. And I don't want to steal Nicole's thunder, so I will let her elaborate. And at Community Alternatives of Violence, we're working with those who have used violence in their relationships and their families. Um, we run classes for them uh, from a psychoeducational standpoint where we're trying to get changes in belief systems to get them to understand what they've done, take responsibility for it, and make those effective changes in their belief system and their behaviors so that they stop using their violence and mm -hmm. then their families are safe and their children are safe. So Joe, if your goal is to change behavior, Nicole, what is your goal with the work that you folks do at Epic? Yeah, I would say that we're two sides to the same coin. Our goal is the same, is to prevent violence. We like to say we kind of want to work ourselves out of jobs eventually, right? We don't want to have to be dealing with all of these horrible things forever. With that said, though, we are our focus is the victim. We are a community-based advocacy center, which means that we don't work within the systems. We work with clients in an outreach um, perspective. We've got a shelter program, so we will shelter folks. Um, who need um, like emergency shelter that are fleeing domestic violence situations or human trafficking, sexual assault, all of those things. Um, and being that we only have 16 beds in our shelter and we aren't able to accommodate the vast need of folks that need that service, we have outreach programs. And our outreach advocates are the ones that populate those outreach offices in Berkeley, Morgan, and Jefferson. And we... Um, kind of deal with lots of clients in the outreach setting and we help them with case management needs. We will accompany them to court, accompany them to the hospital, um, safety planning, as Joe had said, transportation, um, basically anything a client needs in order to access the service delivery system, like our prosecutors, etc. Or if they're not ready to report or if the case has not been deemed, um, you know, there's not enough evidence to move forward or whatever the case is, we will still assist the clients with whatever else their current needs are. And how are you both funded? Joe, how do you get uh, the money to carry on the work that you do? So our primary revenue stream as a fee is from our participants. Um, our license requires that we do impose a fee. There's very few circumstances where we waive it. Um, an inability to pay does not prevent you from getting through the program. Um, we are able to uh, allow someone to do community service. There's, there's, there's ways we can work through to get you through the program. So the fees are our primary revenue stream. Otherwise, we get grants. Uh, Berkeley County has been good to us. City of Martinsburg has been good to us. United Way, Ecolab, they've been very wonderful to us in supporting the work that we do, and then we do fundraising. Are the 
people that are going through your program are they court appointed? Do they are they told by a judge that they have to go through your program, or is it something different? Overwhelming majority are required to be there through the criminal courts, family courts, okay. um, something with the CPS case, probation, parole, day report centers, etc. But we do have those who are not referred by any agency who realize they're going down a path that is not safe, that is not healthy, and they come to us for help. So while most are required to be there, not everyone is required. We, we love those that come before the courts even get involved. Matt, have you had uh, the occasion to assign somebody to a CAV? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because um, I, I was going to have you describe how long the program is. Sure. Um, uh, both men's and women's programs are a minimum of 32 weeks. Um, that is, that's a standard that's set by the state as a minimum of 32 weeks. And I say minimum because if you do everything you're supposed to do, you're complying, there's no new charges, you're out in 32 sessions. Um, but if you commit another domestic while you're with us or we have really some big compliance issues with you, we can extend you. And we work with the prosecutors, if it's a magistrate case, um, before we make those decisions. It's not unilateral, and, and there's there's justification for it. Yeah, I think that's really important to talk about the length of it, that it's mm -hmm. not do a couple of weekends at a class, get a certificate, and then get your charges dismissed or reduced or whatever the agreement is. It's, I mean, it, it takes a commitment. 32 weeks is... That's a lot. Yeah, is that, absolutely. Is that once a week, Joe? It, it is once a week, and, you know, I, I, I'm with Matt. It sounds like a long time, and what we know is it is a long time because we're changing lifelong held beliefs. We're trying to break generational cycles. But if you break that down once a week, mm -hmm. an hour and a half for 32 weeks, it's really only a total of 48 hours of classroom time, which – there's a lot of push to say that's not enough, but you definitely can't short circuit, as, as Matt said. There's, there's no shortcut to this because these are lifelong held beliefs. You know, if you think of a habit that you have, uh, maybe riding a bicycle or something, right? Now, if someone puts you on a bicycle that when you turn your handlebars left, the, car, the, the bike goes right, you know, your head's going to explode and you really need to unlearn that. So we're trying to, you know, we're helping people to unlearn yeah. these unhealthy patterns. So you cannot short circuit and, that. And usually there's other accompanying unhealthy pat or behaviors that accompany domestic violence like you know drug abuse or alcohol abuse quite often yes um so there's not causation but there's absolutely correlation and overlap um so if if someone is not already receiving services for substance abuse you know we do try to funnel them in to get the substance abuse um quite often with those individuals they do need they find out that they, they do have a substance abuse problem and they need to go to detox and rehab. We just put them on a medical hold. We communicate with the referral source so they know, like, okay, well, this is why we've got a pause in the program because they're going to get the help. Um, so we definitely want people to get the help that they need. What, what percentage of these uh, situations are male-on-female violence? Uh, I'm going to say the overwhelming majority. We ha our men's program is uh, probably three times the size of our women's program, but mm -hmm. we are seeing an increase in the women's program. And how many people are in the program, male and female? All told, um, we run around 200. Per year? Per year, yeah. That's um, And that has doubled in the last five years. Um, when I took over, which was right before the pandemic, uh, we had – you know, like 95 to 100, maybe 105. And then the pandemic hit, which saw a sizable shift in everything. And we're now double the size, double the classes, yeah. double the facilitation. Everybody team. was forced to be home with each other all the time. Yes. Right. That was and one of the things that people feared, by the way, when everything got shut down, not just spouses or those living together, but children yes. in those situations too. Yes. Um, you know, that that's definitely something that we, we emphasize because we, we don't tend to think that our children are watching as much. We want to believe our children are hearing the lessons we're telling them. They're not actually watching what we do. So the ways that children are drawn into domestic violence are – are, are just stunning and so we definitely emphasize that mm -hmm. you know I do not come into my class and sit there and tell me your child is not affected because they were upstairs sleeping when you know their other parent and I did what we did it's like no absolutely your children know your children are drawn into it so we we work a lot with that mm -hmm. Larry Schultz who's uh, I don't know how he's been with CAV as long as I've known Larry Schultz yeah yeah uh, one of the things that he has talked about on this show in terms of behavior change is getting the a uh, person to understand and accept that these are decisions they made. Yes. I didn't cause you to do this. You made this decision to do this yes. because it's, well, well, she yelled this to me or she said this to me or she gets under my skin when she does this. 
and then I did this, yes. as if to say, it's not my fault I beat her, it's her fault she made me beat her. Mm-hmm. Yes. And until you accept that as an incorrect premise, yes. you've got the same issue that keeps recurring. Absolutely, and that's part of um, what we call the you know, your personal responsibility, is to understand that you are responsible for your actions your reactions. Mm-hmm. It is you. Um, so we spend a lot of time to you talking about what your motives are. Why did you do it? You didn't, as, as you just so eloquently put there, Rob, you know, you didn't hit her because she took your phone. You hit her because of whatever your emotions, whatever you were feeling inside of you. You know, you felt disrespected. You felt betrayed. You felt like, why did, why did you do it? Um, Everything else, well, it's because I was under the influence. Well, because she triggered me, because she just put a button, she gets in my face. Those are all what we like to call, here's your word for the day, obfuscation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just word salad, excuse, justification, minimizing, denying, and we're not having it. Because, you know, nobody wants to look in the mirror and realize that you hurt the people that are looking to you for protection, that, that love you. Nobody wants to admit that. So we're, we are holding up that mirror, and we're not letting you get away with that. So 32 weeks, 16 weeks in, I screw up. What happens? Well, it depends on the screw up, but most likely. Um, so we do require that if you get charged with another domestic or CPS gets involved with you or something in the last half, which would be those last 16 weeks, we're going to back you up. And I have not had any prosecutor or CPS worker who said, no, 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 don't back them up. Everyone's like, yes, absolutely. Cause what that, do you mean by back them up? We're going to add classes to you. Oh, you're going to add classes. We're going to okay. add classes. Yeah, yeah. And depending what it is, um, we've had situations where we're like, nope, you're going back to class one, you're starting, yeah. or it's like we're going to add half again. It, that's really a decision, and I do try to make that in consultation with the referring agency so that everyone knows what's happening and why it's happening. Now, if I say, well, I'm no, I'm not coming anymore, now what happens to me? You go to jail, right? Well, it, it depends on, yeah, I mean, if it's a CPS case, they're yeah. going to look at that and say, well, now, are we going to, what are we going to do about the reunification? If it's through the criminal courts, then, you know, it, it depends on why you're there, but there's a good chance now we're going to enter your conviction and you're on probation, you've lost your gun rights, or yes, you're going to go serve your jail time. So it, 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 it depends on, on, on the reason that you're with us and what the terms are of your situation as to why you're with us, but there absolutely will be a consequence. And I can tell you as a prosecutor, people – having a setback is expected a lot yes. of times and we can work around that but just when someone stops coming yes that's that's the one thing that i cannot accept and get around yeah. are they are you still with the family while you're going through these courses in many cases or are you are you isolated until you complete that is not up to us. We we have we have both situations where there is a no contact order or or something where you know I can't be in the home until you complete. Um, the only prop I shouldn't say the only a small glitch with that is if you are separated while you're with us, you complete the program, we, you reunify. Now all the stresses that could possibly happen from re, you know from getting back together, and you don't have, have the support tested. service. Yeah. You don't have the support service. Um, so that would just be something that we are very mindful of, and we let people, you know, the whoever the referring agency is, you know, that they've got their tools, but the choice to remain nonviolent and respectful mm-hmm. is theirs. And we do have we call it a graduate program. I say if you successfully completed the program. If you do not have another charge, you're not required to come back for any reason, you are welcome to come back free of charge to a class to get the boost. So if you're out living life and that escalation does happen, you call me up, Joe, help, I need six classes. We're gonna pop you in for six classes, no charge, because you successfully completed. If you do get charged again, referred again, well then we're putting you in the agreement and you're doing the whole 32 weeks. Mm -hmm. And paying. And paying, yes. Nicole, you mentioned you had 16 beds. Are they Mm -hmm. all in that one building or do you have separate locations to, to keep privacy or sure because sometimes you gotta hide people right yes we do we have the one shelter it is located in martinsburg and that shelter is kind of um placed with the responsibility of serving everyone in the panhandle so 16 beds across berkeley morgan and jefferson is obviously not enough um it is non-disclosed but we have been there for almost 50 years now so you can go to the 7-eleven and ask them where the women's shelter is and nine times out of ten they'll be able to tell you so we don't share that address publicly or online or anything um for safety purposes but i will say like the the national model even does seem to be moving less toward non-disclosed locations and just like upgrading security have you had any issues with a 
spouse coming to try and it does happen it does happen from time to time um and i will say that the times that it has happened it's it's actually kind of silly like they just like show up maybe drunk and right. knock on the door and be like i'm here to get my mail or they'll give like some random excuse and we're like you need to leave or yeah. you know we're going to call the cops and then they kind of shuffle off so nothing ever dangerous thank goodness i'm sure it happens in some you know regions but we have been blessed to not have to deal with that a whole lot have you ever been over capacity or had it had a need to have yeah. more beds yeah uh always so we do all of our beds are full pretty much at all times and we operate with like a 30 to 40 person wait list at all times for shelter services so okay. again that means if they're on the wait list for shelter services they're still eligible for our outreach services so we can have an advocate connected with them in the interim to try to satisfy any of those safety needs we can like relocate people in some cases if funding's available we'll put them into a hotel for emergency shelter but yes we are over capacity almost to, like constantly so what's happening with that 30 to 40 percent you said wh where, where are they going what, how they're being yeah them? right so they would be eligible for our outreach services okay. and our outreach advocates are kind of then tasked with figuring out what the circumstances are do you have any family that you can go to since we aren't able to accommodate you in our shelter if it is a dangerous enough situation we will kind of find the money to put them up into a hotel but even that again that's not a long-term you know solution right um, do you what's your budget look like what is your capacity to be able to to afford housing um, if you were to leave so um, just because we can't accommodate them in our shelter we still try to meet all of their needs and kind of find them safety outside of that and on average how, how long does somebody stay in the shelter um, that's a great question. It's anywhere. They kind of like come in and start with like a six month process. Like you can kind of be here for six months. Some people are kind of like in and out. They'll come in and then they're like, you know, I've got a, a train ticket lined up. I'm going to go stay with my sister in Florida or whatever. Okay. Um, so it's kind of a short term thing. But um, sometimes we will have people that are in there for a, a year even while they try to build their lives and their capacity to afford housing. And are children welcome at the shelter? Yes. Okay. Yes. Not unaccompanied, but okay. yes. Yeah. Mm hmm that's an important point to make, by the way, not not on a company, Correct. Yeah. <laughs> not a daycare center. Yes, I'm sure with the rising um, home cost and rentals, rent costs, that it's becoming even more difficult for people. Is that are you noticing that there's more? Um, a greater need for your services yeah I would say this is not a, a statistic that I can I can back with any kind of research but I would say a good 90% of the clients that come through our door housing is the like primary need I can't find affordable housing we do have the capacity but they have to be an abusive relate relationship correct, correct? it's correct. not just I need a house yes yeah, okay, correct yeah, okay. correct yeah we will have an influx of folks who are like homelessness for instance is their primary need but they aren't experiencing violence so we would refer them out to the homeless coalition or other services Services in the area that deal with that as a primary need but if they are fleeing domestic violence or homeless as a result of domestic violence um, trying to figure out where we're going to put them in a like that they can afford is is really really becoming a problem especially in Berkeley County the rent is just sure. insane there's not affordable units um, we do have capacity to do like a housing assessment with them we pair with the um, homeless coalition of West Virginia we do that housing assessment they get put onto that housing list but people sit on that list for years so it's like even that is not a, a long-term solution is human trafficking an issue in our community in terms of how it affects who resides at your facility yes sir yeah we we definitely will shelter uh, so any of the victimizations we serve we call them the big four domestic violence sexual assault human trafficking and stalking um, we will serve any of those folks in our outreach or our shelter offices um, human trafficking is a problem in the community um, it definitely is more familial so we will see that trafficking is taking place in the basis of like a relationship so um, maybe partner is trafficking their partner for drugs or for rent money or whatever the case may be or their their children um, unfortunately it's not so often the like taken that you see like yeah. Yeah. they're being snatched off the tree or the street it's happening in homes in the community oh you see that in the courtroom Matt oh, yeah <clears throat> Excuse me. with children being human trafficked by their parents um I, I, I'm trying to think what uh, it, I mean I know it's happening um, it's very difficult set of circumstances because you have to mm -hmm. you have to break that child away from whatever bad situation they're in and then and then develop the evidence from that um i'd say it's been it's suspected a lot more than it's able to be charged 
And, and if I could, I sure. think that that's a good point. You Kids that are in those situations, even adults that are in those situations, don't really have the capacity all the time to identify that they are a victim of human trafficking. We, as advocates, are kind of the ones that like do our intakes, we do our screening, and then often we're the first ones to let them know, hey, um, you're a victim of human trafficking. And then it's kind of like, oh, <laughs> that's what that is. Yes. <laughs> and it, oftentimes, I'm sure children don't want to get their parents in trouble. Yes. Or they're afraid to. And the same with a spousal relationship as well, because sometimes the consequences of saying something are almost as bad as the consequences of not. Absolutely. Right. Uh, there are some things I want to get to in terms of what you guys got going on this month as a way to uh, to uh, uh, be seen and uh, get some money raised as well. Joe, do you want do you have do you know this is off the top of your head or do you want to go off the flyers? Um well, there's a lot of them. I'll, there's I'll, a lot. Hey, take I'll, that one I'll, first. I'll, I'll refer yeah, because we, we only have about three and a half minutes. Oh, golly. Okay. So, yes, um, with Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we are painting the tan panhandle purple. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a, a whole go. lot of activities going on, free family activities, as well as some fundraisers for us, because as you refer, you know, we are nonprofits yes. and we do we need, need money. help. We need, the money. we need help. So the, the big one, the culmination will be the end of the month. I'll start with that because that's the big fundraiser. It is a decade dance. It's our inaugural decade dance with our, our agencies partnering together at the Hollywood Casino in Charlestown on October 26th from 6 to 10 p.m. Um, tickets are 65 per individual or a couple of 120. We've got a photo booth. We're going to have some raffles. We've got a photographer dancing, you know, light show, cash flow. I mean, it's just going to be a really good time. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the big culmination. Um, in uh, Morgan County, in, in Berkeley Springs, the week before that, um, October 19th, we're super excited. We're having a concert at the New Earth Granary in downtown Berkeley Springs. The opening act are three of our facilitators who will be singing. Larry? Yes. Not Larry oh, this no. year. Oh, not so Larry sure this year. No. <laughs> um, but the fact that we have Larry who's not singing and three other facilitators singing is, is pretty remarkable. Yeah. It's, a, it's a pretty good bench. you got some that's depth. A, we've, we've got some depth, yes. Yeah. But then the headliner is Kippen Martin, who is a local recording artist. She's based out of Frederick. She is fantastic. She is donating her set awesome. to this cause. Um, and so that is October 19th from 8 to 10 p.m. at the New Earth Granary. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minute warning. Um, okay, I'm, I'm on a roll here. Do you want this? I'll, I'll keep going. Um, free ch children's story hour down at the Charlestown Library on October 17th from 4 to 6 p.m. We've got some board members and community volunteers who are going to read stories about feelings. We're going to have coloring. We're going to have some snacks. And it's just a really good time for us to talk with families and kids. Um, all of this is available on our websites and on our Facebook pages, so you don't have to remember these dates because clearly I can't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> October 23rd, the Daily Grind is generously allowing us to come in. If you buy your morning coffee between 9 and 11, you come on over. We'll treat you to a free pastry, and we can have a conversation about what Epic and Cab are doing in the community. Mm -hmm. um, then we've got two paint nights left, um, right? Ooh, this Saturday, October 12th at Ranson at Benchwarmers, there's a paint night. Uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. and then f Friday, October this Friday, 11th. Tomorrow. <laughs> Friday, October 11th, <laughs> tomorrow, um, at the St. Vincent de Paul Catholic Church in downtown Berkeley Springs uh, is another paint night. Uh, that's also kicking off, I believe, Apple Butter Festival, so you can go get your paint on and then mm -hmm. you can have some apple butter fun. Last thing, I feel like a carnival barker. Um, we had a wonderful uh, knitter who knitted a, a shawl for us. It's got a lot of purple in it, purple being the color of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. She's donated her shawl. She refuses to be identified. We are raffling that off $10 a ticket. All tickets, all registration can be done through either of our websites, um, www.comav.org and epicwb.org. Uh, there you go. Everything is available there. Joe, Nicole, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. Great Thank to have you, have you both. Us. I hope you fundraise uh, to record uh, levels there. Thank you so much, Rob. All the best about you. Your tickets. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you both. <laughs>